What up, y'all? Welcome back. Another episode of the BBB Weekly Film. If you guys were on the channel, you would have seen that we launched NBA Top Shot series yesterday. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how many of you guys are actually into that stuff. I'm sure not many of you because you're not degenerates like Noah and myself. But if you are into it, you're trying to make some money. If you're trying to lose some money, make sure you stick with us on that channel. Uh, but today, we are going to start looking at, uh, you know, I, I want to call it a forgotten people because right now everything that's going on is purely rookies based. You know, the rookie hype is there. We had the senior bowl, which no one cares about. Actually, everyone cares about it. I just, I don't care about it. We have, you know, there's no combine anymore. So people are trying to do like backwards algorithms to figure out how many, how fast these players are based on a video. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, trade season, but we don't want to forget about the veterans because at the end of the day, you cannot build a dynasty completely full of rookies. Uh, I mean, you, you, you can try and 2020 was probably the best year to do it, but 2021, I would not advise for that. So we're going to take a look at some veterans that we think are a little bit forgotten about, you know, potentially some value there um, and something that you can, uh, you can go after and pursue and really just kind of solidify the core, the core like of your team and having some of these productive guys that you can probably get, for a pretty good discount uh given what's going on but before we do that man no what's up man you know the deal i just told you we had to push back recording for about 20 minutes because all it does on the east coast nowadays is snow and then stops and then snows again i, I plowed the driveway we got a pretty long driveway i mean i did it at like 10 a.m thought it was done with once i got inside it started snowing is that a euphemism for your dick size I don't even know what I said, honestly. Whenever I talk, I kind of black out whatever I, I just came out of my mouth. So it could have been, I don't know, if it was a bad euphemism, then no. If it was a good one, yeah, let's rock with it. But yeah, it's 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 been a dreary day, but we're going to try to spice things up by talking about wide receivers that everybody loves to hate and we love to love. And by veterans, we just mean they've been in the league for at least three years, right? We don't want these rookies and sophomores. It's too easy to be like, oh, buy Denzel Mims, which is a video I put out, so check that out. Or like you know, two years ago saying, oh, buy Calvin Ridley, buy DJ Moore after a down rookie season. That's just too easy to hit on. These are more guys that, you know, they're decreasing in value because they are older. They're like 25, which is 30. If they're a running back, they're 28, which is retired if you're a wide receiver. And you can really like, the thing I don't get, and I guess we can talk about it more after the intro, but like if you're in a startup and the picks are on the board, you draft kickers and they end up being picks. Like the 105 is probably going to go before a guy like Keenan Allen. But if Jamar Chase is in the player pool and it's an actual startup, like I'm not so sure Jamar Chase goes much further up the board than a Keenan Allen. So I think you can find those arbitrage plays in terms of these players, which we're about to mention. But we got to do something before we start talking about them, Mike. I can't think of what that possibly could be, but uh, I have a feeling it might be the intro. It might be. Let's, let's, let's let the viewers figure it out. All right. So look, we're going to go through these players uh, kind of one by one here and just, you know, give our view on them. And, you know, Noah and I are usually pretty in sync on this on the veteran side, because as much as we both love rookies, there is always value to be had on the veterans. And, you know, if you follow me, you'll know what I preach. And what I preach is this hoard rookie drafts from, you know, you know, the prior season to the end of the season leading up to the draft. But once you're on the clock or once the draft is near, always flip for veterans like i i never ever use all of my rookie picks if i have like six or seven rookie picks in a class at rookie first i'll probably end up using you know one two maybe maybe three of them tops the rest i'll either trade out to another year to get more assets or i'll trade for veterans so this is a this is a core part of my dynasty strategy uh, I don't know if it's the same for, you know, but like, you know, no, I sell all my picks veterans. well before I have six of them in the first <laughs> round. I just, I just stack up on vets and hope I win every year. Yeah. So it's another approach. I mean, you, you got, you got to have veterans to win, man. And veterans will always be cheap at this time of the year. The reason why I want to go over this is because right now, like, you know, people are getting hyped on the rookies and like, basically from like, you know, call it March, April, May, that's going to be like some of the best times to buy veterans for either rookie picks or, or other things. So, you know, we're going to go jump into it here. No, I'll let you kick it off with your first guy um, and why you're interested. Yeah. I think he might be the only running back 
in this list. One, because honestly, like outside the top eight to 10 guys, it's a little bit risky. And two, when we're talking veterans, nobody really wants to buy 25, 26 year old running backs and understandably so given, you know, the fall off or the perceived fall off. But one guy that I'm higher on than consensus, and I actually don't know if it's higher than consensus because I feel like ADP right now is a little skewed and it's not catching up. Like I would assume a guy like Travis Etienne would go ahead of this guy in a startup. It's Aaron Jones. And I put out a video with my top 12 dynasty running backs and I had a guy like Derrick Henry inside. I think he was like my six or seven. And people in the comments are like, well, you have Derrick Henry that high and he's old. Why not have Aaron Jones a little bit higher than I had him? I think he was like my wide, my running back 17. And I thought about it and I'm like, the only negatives that come with Aaron Jones, I guess it's threefold, but I kind of want to throw two of them out the window. One is his age. He's going to be 26 going into this year. But you look at startup drafts, Mike, and like who are the top five or six running backs off the board? It's McCaffrey, it's Kamara, it's Dalvin Cook, it's Nick Chubb, it's you know Ezekiel Elliott maybe a little bit later. We look at those guys' ages or touches. Like Ezekiel Elliott has over 1,600 touches. Uh, Alvin Kamara has almost 1,000 touches. McCaffrey has 1,000 touches. He's a year younger. But you look at like Dalvin Cook and Zeke's age, they're the same age. You look at and Alvin Kamara's age, they're all the same age as Aaron Jones. They have more touches on their body. And I think the second fold of this threefold argument is Aaron Jones seems to be injury prone. And although he did miss a big portion of his games earlier in his career, he's only missed two games over his last two seasons. And because of that, right, even though he's had full seasons worth of playing, right, he only has 782 touches on his body because Green Bay does not want to commit to him. So although he's 26 and he seems old and he's going to be 26 heading into this year, I don't think he is 26 in the same way And Ezekiel Elliott is 26. We saw Ezekiel Elliott break down, whereas Aaron Jones was a beast for most of the year, even coming back from injury a little bit earlier than we expected. He continued to be efficient, continued to be productive, did very well all the way through the playoffs. I don't think that he is necessarily as old as the number on his profile says, and that's like kind of ignorant, but when you compare it to other guys, it makes kind of sense. Uh, and then I think the third part of this argument to fade him is he's a free agent this year. Well, when's the last time we saw a free agent as good as Aaron Jones, who's going to command a lot of money because he is by far and away the best free agent running back in this free agent class. And the fact that this isn't a deep running back class, only I'd say Najee Harris is more talented than him. When's the last time we've seen a running back that is this coveted, this versatile, this dynamic, get signed to a new team or even get re-signed to his own team and not get a ton of touches, right? Green Bay isn't using him as a 300 touch workhorse, a 350 touch workhorse, when that realistically could be in his range of outcomes next year. We go back through time and we look at other running backs that have signed on different teams in free agency, whether it's Le'Veon Bell, whether it's Melvin Gordon, whether it was like Kenyon Drake, even this year going back to Arizona after being there for a short, a short stint in 2019, they all saw upwards of 200, 250, even 300 carries for a guy like Le'Veon Bell. If Aaron Jones finds his way onto a new team like a Miami, like a Tampa Bay, like a maybe even like a New England, which would be a lower end team. He's going to be the best running back on that roster. He's going to be a three down back and he'd probably be used a little bit more than what he's being used in Green Bay right now. And despite not being used a ton in Green Bay, he's finished top six in points per game each of the last two years. So although you want to think of him as a lesser talent than a Dalvin Cook and a lesser talent than a McCaffrey and Alvin Kamara and those guys, sure, talent wise he is, but he's been on the field more consistently than those guys. He's produced in the top six more consistently than most of those guys like Kamara on a point per game basis and, and McCaffrey have been higher and Dalvin Cook as well, but they've also missed more time than Aaron Jones has. And, you know, as I said before, he's really using all three facets of the game, despite being in a situation where Jamal Williams comes out of nowhere and steals touches and AJ Dillon does as well. Only he and Dalvin Cook have rushed for a thousand yards had 40 receptions and at least 10 touchdowns each of the past two years. So he's just an all around running back that I think is getting a little bit too much shade thrown on him because we want to fade these guys who turn 26 and we like write them off for the rest of their career. Like I'd much rather invest in an Aaron Jones at 26 than a Joe Mixon at 24, whose situation is going to be a lot worse than Jones is even if Jones were to move teams, because I think he has shown that wherever he goes, Unless it's Green Bay, he's going to be a workhorse. And if he stays in Green Bay, he's part of an elite offense where he has been a top-end option each of these past two years. Well, as you can see, guys, we are we are back in full dynasty offseason because we've got another <laughs> infamous, infamous <Soliloquy>. Noah. <laughs> Noah Pyre's soliloquy. Uh, beautiful. Love it. Love it. Music to my ears. Look. You know, I, I, so I'll give you a quick insight. We're going to look at the LFA ADP, but I totally agree with with you, Noah. Like ADP at this point is 
I mean, one, well, first of all, it's from mock drafts, so you guys know how I feel about that. But two, it's just it's like they, they don't they don't have the rookies yet. So like without the rookies in there, it's it's really not that valuable. Um, but it's a good point. I mean, DLF it's what it's what we have. So let's work with it. Aaron Jones right now is running back sixteen. So here are the running backs going ahead of him: Antonio Gibson, Cam Makers, Ezekiel Elliott, Miles Sanders, Clyde Abuzalaire. Here are some of the guys going after him: Austin Eckler, James Robinson, uh, Joe Mixon. So I think you know, to me, it feels like he's kind of in that right range, right? Um, like this is a time where I I don't really go too heavy for running backs with question marks because I don't know where they're gonna land. What I will say is this: like I I think that we should not be scared of where Aaron Jones lands on behalf of Aaron Jones, we should be scared of where he lands on behalf of whoever else is there. That's why I don't invest in running backs. So like, let's say Aaron Jones goes and lands on a Tampa Bay, know, like Tampa Ronald Bay. Jones is dead. Ronald Jones is dead. If he lands on a Jacksonville, right. Rest in peace to my James Robinson stuff. Like even as much as I love them, I think it's going to be a dead value kill for both of them. If he lands on a, I mean, if he lands on Dallas, obviously Zeke's getting cut. So we know that, um, <laughs> If he lands on like you know the Bears, Miami, or Miles Gaskin's going. Bears, like Miami, like he's a value killer himself. So I think he has that going for him. Um, like where I have him is is kind of like you know similarly in that range, but not because I dislike him. It's just because I'm trying to weigh risks and risk and rewards right now. Um, so I actually have a, a James Robinson ahead of them ahead of him mainly because I guess I, I'm trying to be a little bit more risky there which doesn't make sense. So yeah, I, have him, I have James Robinson, I think two spots ahead of him as well, but the names you listed that were ahead of him that I have behind him, I have Miles Sanders behind him just because I feel like his situation is more iffy than Aaron Jones. And we don't even know what Aaron Jones, situation is going to be. I have Ezekiel mm-hmm. Elliott behind him because I think we kind of saw a fall off. And although it might be like one more year of elite production because that offense is crazy. I'm not so sure that he's going to be efficient enough for that to even really wait to balance out. And also yeah. Clyde Edwards Hilaire, like he was part of an elite offense. They still have Tyree Kill. So although the goal line touches you could say are going to go up, Tyree Kill is still scoring 50, 60 yard touchdowns every single game. I mean, the goal line carries can't be there if you're scoring from that far out every week. So I just trust Aaron Jones's talent and wherever he's going to go, whoever's going to pay him is going to use him as a true work, uh, true work yeah. type of running back. I, I would love to see Aaron Jones stay in Green Bay. Obviously, that's that's the best spot because they have a great O line, top scoring offense, and he's he's been there, so he's done that. And and you know, you know, as good as people think Gage Dillon is, he's not. They're not Aaron Jones, and he's Jamal Williams and not Aaron Jones. So I would love to see him stay there. But you know, if he isn't able to stay there, some other places I would love to see him go. Uh, San Francisco, I think he'd be a great fit there, and Raheem Mostert would be dead, and Jeff Wilson would be dead. Uh, if he did go there, I think there'd still be a committee. I don't think he'd get like a workhorse role there, but I think that'd be a pretty decent landing spot for him, right? Mm-hmm. Um, another good spot could potentially be like a. I don't. I don't know if 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 uh, if this is a great spot, but I, I think like if he went to like Buffalo Bills, um, the problem is like he'd get vultured by Josh Josh Allen, but obviously Zach Moss and Singletary would be dead. And then the other one is like. Let's say the Seahawks, you know, let go of uh, Chris Carson, right? And then they add Aaron Jones to the mix, provide a little bit of a receiving game. He's obviously a very physical runner and kind of fits that uh, fits that team pretty well. Uh, tackle breaking monsters. So it kind of just rolls right into where Chris Carson was at. I think those are like some decent spots. I don't think I would value him any higher in any of those spots, which is why I'm like a little bit concerned. It's like if I knew he was staying in Green Bay, I would definitely value him higher, but I don't really see any other places other than maybe San Francisco that kind of matches that. So that's my concern with Aaron Jones. I'm not really selling him, but I'm not really, I don't think I'm going out to buy him either. And it'll probably look stupid because he's just, he's just like a really fucking good player. And every year he just does what he does. And we all, everyone looks stupid for fading him. Yeah, it's so hard for like to put a running back on this list. Like I kind of felt bad doing it because realistically, I'm probably not paying the iron price for a guy like Aaron Jones when this time next year, I'd probably be putting him in this list again. Like, oh, he did it again. He's top seven, top six, top five this year again. Uh, But in terms of price, I'd be willing to pay a mid first round pick. I prefer him to most receivers in this class if you are a contender just to give you that instant production. And as I said before, I I prefer him to every running back in this class other than Najee Harris. And it remains to be seen where Najee Harris goes. If, he, if Harris lands in like a Philadelphia Eagles type of situation, I'd rather have Aaron Jones because you know what Najee Harris is going to be splitting time with a guy like Miles Sanders. So it remains to be seen and buying him now is going to allow you – well, I wouldn't like sell a rookie pick now because they inflate in value – 
but I think just buying on the unknown because so many people are worried about where he's going to land without taking into consideration, oh, he's really good. And wherever he goes, he's probably going to be used as a player who's really good. I think you can, you can scrape some value out of a guy like Aaron Jones right now. Yeah, I got um, – this is for contenders, but I have Michael Thomas on here. I think he's fallen like way, 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 way out of favor. And, you know, you know, DLF ADP has him at wide receiver 10, right? And that's, to me, that's pretty low. You know, that's like basically start of the third round. I mean, if I get Michael Thomas in the third round, he's still like age 27. I think I'm going to fire that like nine times out of 10. He, historically speaking, he's one of the most prolific producers uh, in the NFL in terms of like, in terms of the experience level. And he had a down year, you know, he got hurt. You know, people called him slant boy. He got his feelings hurt too. Uh, so punch so people in the face, acting reckless. Started, yeah. started acting reckless, punching people in the face, whatever. But at the end of the day, like this guy's just an elite talent, in my opinion. And, you know, even without Drew Brees, like he was still dominating in terms of market share from Taysom Hill. So if Taysom Hill's there and then if Jameis Winston gets in there, Jesus Christ, there's going to be. He was dominating with Teddy Bridgewater too. Yeah. So, so I think Michael Thomas is, is definitely someone that's disrespected. I think that wide receiver 10 price tag, honestly, I think that's under uh that's overselling what his value is because based on what i like the feeling that i get from the community and the feeling i get from people dealing with people and like trying to do trades i wouldn't be surprised if some people started putting him outside of their top 12 and you know started taking like you know let's see guys that are ranked behind like terry mclaurin i've seen i've seen multiple votes where people put terry mclaurin ahead of michael thomas t higgins ahead of michael thomas right i, I don't have michael thomas behind those guys and i love t higgins right i love 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 t higgins and then you know this doesn't even include the rookie class jamar chase i i'm not gonna like i would bet you money that in some of once during peak rookie hype season you're not going to be able to get jamar chase for michael thomas if, if you're on the clock and, and someone has jamar chase on their available and you offer the Michael Thomas, you're going to get turned down most of the time. And for me, if I'm a contender, I'm I'm smashing the buy button on Michael Thomas right there nine times out of ten. If I can get Michael Thomas for Jamar Chase, I'm doing it uh, because you know he had bad TD performance this year as well. We know that's kind of random. Um, you know he hasn't been an elite TD producer, but he has a size, and we know he's goddamn good enough to get there. So I think Michael Thomas is a screaming, screaming buy for anyone that's a contender. Obviously, if you're a rebuilder, it's a tough sell because, you know, he's, he's a 27. He's about to be 28. Once he hits 28, he's basically 35. And then once he's 35, he's dead. So, you know, in, in classic classic dynasty, dynasty fashion. But if you're a contender, right, this is someone that's going to produce at least for another three years, if not five. Well into his early 30s, he's still going to give you like wide receiver two production. I'm very confident in that. So as a contender, I think Michael Thomas is just is just a fantastic target to go after right now. Yeah, and I think his biggest weakness is also his biggest strength. Like, you brought it up. He's slant boy. But guess what? To be a slant boy, you don't need to rely on 4-4 four, four speed, 4-3 four, speed, and getting open because of that speed. He's just a really good receiver, has a good release off the line, has built rapport with every quarterback that's been under center. As you said, if Jameis Winston is in the fold next year, he's going to produce. If they bring in some bum rookie in Sean Payton's offense, he's going to produce. Like, Teddy Bridgewater, in my opinion, my very humble opinion, watching him this year made me feel sick. And with him under center last year in the Saints offense, he looked really good with Teddy Bridgewater. He looks good with Drew Brees, who has a noodle arm. He looks good with Taysom Hill, who isn't even a quarterback. So to have him going this late, and we always talk about it, right? That tier one of receivers is that top four guys that are interchangeable. And then the tier two is legit like wide receiver five overall to wide receiver 13 overall. The fact that he's on the end of that spectrum, and I agree with you, like people will probably rank him lower than wide receiver 10 when it's actually like money mm-hmm. on the line and people look back at his numbers they're like oh he didn't even play this year he kind of sucked without realizing he had a high ankle sprain i'm pretty sure he just got like surgery on something and he wasn't even supposed to play this year i think people are going to be lower on him than wide receiver 10 when it all like realistically why is he any lower than deandre hopkins deandre hopkins didn't have that incredible of a season i know he's going to his second year with kyler murray but Michael Thomas is younger. He's recently been more productive than DeAndre Hopkins. And I think the type of player he is, the skill set that he has, there's no reason to believe he can't produce until he's 32, 33, 34 years old. And he's in the NFC South. They do not play defense in that division. The only team that plays any sort of defense, at least pass in the past game, are the Saints. And he's on the Saints. So six games a year, he's playing the Falcons, who are bums. Sorry, Nick. Carolina Panthers, who stink or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who are in the playoffs and are in the Super Bowl now, but their, their secondary isn't really doing much. Although like I think his name is Carlton Davis has absolutely locked him up every game. I just see no reason for his value to fall off that big of a cliff. And I think in a similar vein, 
this might be a little bit biased, but I have my boy Keenan Allen. And I think also he's falling off the map. Now, I, I would expect him to actually be going high in DLF ADP just because he's tied to a guy like Justin Herbert. And he had such a great season and the rapport that they built there was elite. But when it comes down to it, again, when money's on the line. And wide receiver 19. Wide receiver 19. I have him as my wide receiver 17. But when there's money on the line and it's time to push the button between a guy like Keenan Allen, who's going to be 29 years old, or, you know, even like a Tyler Boyd, who's 25, 26 with Joe Burrow, or as you said, like a Rashad Bateman or a Jamar Chase, who are rookies and you feel like that extra longevity is the proper play. It's going to be hard in a startup to choose a Keenan Allen over those guys. But you look at the situation that he's in and it's it's pristine, right? Not only was he producing this year with Justin Herbert on our center, but we look at the fact that Hunter Henry is a free agent. They might bring him back. I'm not so sure. They might draft Kyle Pitts and I'd be very happy with that. But even if they bring in Kyle Pitts and Hunter Henry comes back, like worst case scenario, the kind of rapport that he built with Justin Herbert was basically unseen, even with Philip Rivers there. Like he was their main red zone target. And by main, I mean like the only red zone target, unless it was like fourth and one with two seconds left and they throw it to fucking Parham every two seconds and like made me cry on the inside. But Keenan Allen was just always open and he has that type of game where he's probably going to be able to produce well into his thirties. Like we've seen a guy like Julian Edelman with a very similar skill set produce until he was 33, 34 years old. And then he fell off this year because of injury. So in my opinion, Keenan Allen, a little bit of a Homer pick, but there's no reason to believe he's going to fall off a map. And you could look at his splits with Austin Eckler. And that's fair to say like this past year, if you look at his splits, right with Austin Eckler, 102 receptions, 968 yards, six touchdown pace without him, 131 catches, 1355 yards, 13 touchdowns. The difference is Anthony Lynn is gone. And the way that that offense ran when Austin Eckler came back was abysmal. They went from kind of an air raid system. They did feed Keenan Allen a lot over the middle, but a system that wasn't afraid to take shots to one that was, it made Donald Trump look liberal. Like it was the most conservative offense I've seen in my entire life. Like they would just dump it off to Austin Eckler two inches behind the line of scrimmage, see him pick up four yards and like just clap on the sideline and let the clock run out. It was disgusting. I know the OC is still there. I'm not sure if he's going to stick around, but it can't be as bad as it was last year. Herbert going into his second year, Keenan Allen coming back from that late season injury. I think we're going to all realize what type of player he is and what he is is a player who's basically a lock for 150, 160 targets and finish as a top 10 receiver once again. Yeah, I think, you know, Keenan Allen, Michael Thomas, we've made the comparison before. And I think, you know, one thing to be mindful of here is Michael Thomas played with like a high, a sprain, um, high ankle sprain, right? Mm -hmm. And like he later on revealed that like, yo, like I actually couldn't play, but like they said they needed me. So I played. So, and then I, I forget, I forgot if he got like off season surgery or something, um, but he was definitely not hundred percent. And then, you know, Keenan Allen down the stretch got hurt too, but these are both guys that are PPR monsters. Right. And, you know, I would say Keenan Allen situation is even better than Michael Thomas. Cause like you said, he has Justin Herbert and we'll see how, what, what that means in terms of the offense with the new coach and everything with Anthony Lee gone. Cause that was definitely one of the most frustrating offenses I've ever seen. Uh, so look it, again, like I think the one concept here that I really want to drive home though, is like, we're telling you what these ADPs are like Michael Thomas, wide receiver 10, Keenan Allen, wide receiver 19. And it may it, like, it sounds low or whatever, but like, because you're trading for them, like this, there's a big disconnect between like, where you draft how you draft in the startup and how people value players in startup versus how they trade for them like in season because once you once you've like played a year out you know people know where they're at you're going to be able to take advantage of people that are rebuilding versus contending right and then also the other thing is like you know someone like michael thomas right last year probably would have been like a first round like second round startup pick this year he's going in the third round right honestly to me it should be a second round pick but like I bet you you're going to have a hard time. You would have an easy time acquiring Michael Thomas for two firsts, right? But if you try to acquire a second round starter pick or an early third round starter pick for two firsts, like you wouldn't get it done because like in the startup, people, one, when people want to make picks, but two, like, it's just like, that's not enough value to get into that early round, the early, like, I also one, feel like rounds. if someone for like Keenan Allen, for example, like if someone were to offer you the 105 for Keenan Allen, you'd be like, no, I'm taking the 105. But yeah. if you draft after the NFL draft happens and it's Jamar Chase and Keenan Allen on the board and the way your draft has lined up and you think you can contend, you're probably taking Keenan Allen over a guy like Jamar Chase, like maybe six out of 10 times. So I think there's that disconnect there as well. So in these trades and like the prices that you pay, you can probably get Keenan Allen for a late first right now. And if you can do that, I'd smash that every day of the week. Yeah, I don't think you can get Jamar Chase 
Uh, the, the, he's not one, but any other rookie, you, you probably could. The reason why I don't think you can is because Jamar Chase's value is just so tied to Justin Jefferson that like mm-hmm. it's it, like that like that's all that's all like I think about in terms of my ranks as well. It's like, dude, I can't I can't like rationally put Jamar Chase like 15 spots behind Justin Jefferson or whatever it is, right? And I think <laughs> you can't put value, Nikhil Harry 15 spots behind Brandon Ayuk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I can put Nikhil Harry 15 spots behind fucking I don't know anyone shitty, but. Yeah, when it comes to uh, J- Jamar Chase, I don't think that's possible. But like anyone else, I think I think you definitely have fair game. And if you are a contender, like giving up that late first, uh, assuming the quarterbacks have passed, that's the other thing. Like if the quarterbacks are gone and you're looking at mostly like wide receivers in that tier two, tier three range, why not just fire on a guy like Keenan Allen, who we know he's going to be a playing till at least he's 30. He's not someone that's relied on athleticism ever, right? He's not athletic at all. He just relies on his technique and his technique is flawless. And he's one of the best technicians in the game. And one of the, if you guys have never seen Keenan Allen play basketball too, he's got one of the most dang crossovers. Uh, this guy breaks ankles, like, like on the real basketball court, man, I killed to see Allen Robinson lineup or not Allen Robinson, Allen Iverson line up in the slot and just absolutely yeah. bury any corner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude. Allen Iverson would just like cross people over and step over them. Like, like, <laughs> Tyron Lou. But, yeah. Like Tyron Lou. So yeah, so that look, I think those are both great veteran pieces. Obviously, if you're a contender, you're not trying to target these guys because you know their value is not going to increase. But they're like the perfect instance of production. They're like production from here on out for Michael Thomas and Keenan Allen is going to look like this, and their value is going to look like this. So it's going to like it's going to basically like widen out, right? And that's what it's going to look like. And that's exactly what you want to do. Uh, those are the guy, type of guys you want to fill out your contending rosters with. So that's why they're a good buy. So next. On my list, uh, I'm just gonna deal them up in a pair, and it, it's it's Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. So Mike Evans currently going as the dynasty wide receiver 15 per DLF. Chris Godwin going as the wide receiver 12. Now, uh, I think honestly that wide receiver 15 price tag is is a bit too high on Mike Evans based on what what we see because he just gets disrespected every year. I mean, another season with a thousand yards and 13 touchdowns. Uh, you know, people hate on him. And and the thing with this season is this. Mike Evans was not healthy, like, for a lot of the season. He's like, he started the season with hamstring injuries, uh, middle of the season, got hand, hamstring re-aggravated. Like, so he was playing hurt, like, throughout the entire time. So he was their goal back for, like, season. the first four weeks, right? Yeah, he was basically their goal line back and scored 13 touchdowns. And, you know, as much as people want to think John Tom Brady is washed, I personally don't believe that he's washed. And... I think that Tom Brady will kind of continue to fire for a couple of years. Um, so I think it's going to be, it's going to be interesting, right? I think a healthy season, second season with Mike Evans and, uh, and Chris Godwin, I, I guess Chris Godwin might be gone as well, which is another thing. Like Mike Evans might just be like the guy uh, going forward and Tom Brady loves going to him. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you guys watch the games, but he loves going to Mike Evans deep. Like he's tossing him up there. He doesn't care if it's freaking interceptions. It's YOLO Tom Brady time. I think, the touchdowns with their ad hypothesis, you know, I thought that Mike Evans would, would smash this year because I thought he had touchdown upside and he absolutely did. Right. He scored 13 touchdowns. Obviously the yardage wasn't there. So that's like the next step is, you know, evolving in that offense and kind of becoming that true number one and seeing what happens there. But I think Mike Evans is a great value. I think you can probably acquire him for a single first. Like if you're sitting in that like 1.08, 1.07 range, like anyone after Jamar chase, you can probably flip for Mike Evans. And honestly, you might be able to get like Mike Evans plus for Jamar Chase. And I think those are, those are nice deals to have. And he's young enough where I think, yeah, I think he's still young enough to like kind of hold that value and not fall off a total value cliff. Right. And, you know, he's, he's 27. Right. Um, but yeah, Mike Evans, man, I think, I think he's just a good buy. And then Chris Godwin, you know, wide receiver 12 may seem high, but to me, I think that's, that's value because a lot of people had Chris Godwin as their dynasty wide receiver one overall coming into last season. And again, I'm going to cut you to- off real quick, Mike. Sorry about this. But I remember getting into a Twitter, Twitter argument last year between I was saying, you know, Juju Smith-Schuster has done everything that Chris Godwin and A.J. Brown had done to this point in their career, except he did it in his first and second year, whereas Chris Godwin did it in his third and obviously A.J. Brown as a rookie. And I got into argument. I'm like, so what if what happens if Chris Godwin this upcoming year? puts up 800 yards and face plants. Are we going to move him outside of our top 10 wide receivers? He's like, no, we know he's good. Well, guess what? He put up 800 yards this year. He kind of face planted because of injury. And now he's outside of our top 10 receivers because of one down year when we just had him inside of our top three. I think it's obviously like drawing the comparison to Juju, who's completely fallen off, I think is a little bit foolish to have a guy like Chris Godwin, who is a more athletic, more well-rounded receiver than Juju, 
fall this far because of one season that was riddled with injuries. Like the guy broke his finger and tried to come back, I think in the same week and continue to play through it. Yeah. I mean, Chris Godwin was still pretty damn good. And, you know, people are worried about his free agency. I think I've learned a little bit about the lesson of worrying about that too much with guys like Stefan Diggs and DeAndre Hopkins. At the end of the day, man, if these guys are good, you kind of just want them on your team. And uh, I think he is pretty landing spot proof. I, I'm excited to see where he goes. I think there's a lot of great spots for him. But I think you can buy him right now on the, you know, basically question mark, question mark, uh, un, un, you know, unknown landing spot discount. And he, he's just fallen way too far for me. I mean, in DLF, he's going behind you know, Terry McLaurin, I would personally have him ahead of Terry McLaurin. You know, he's going like a full round behind DeAndre Hopkins. I, I really don't see any reason why I would do that. He's going a full round behind Calvin Ridley. Like he did what Calvin Ridley did like last year already and, and to another degree. So I, I think, you know, people are just, they're panicking a lot on Tampa Bay wide receivers. And I don't understand why, because, you know, going to last season, we said, this is one of the most talented wide receiver duos in the NFL. So why is it now that after one year of in, an injury riddled year, a fir first year with a new quarterback and a new offense, people are all of a sudden like bailing. So that doesn't really make too much sense to me. I think the Tampa Bay wide receivers, uh, you know, I guess Mike Evans will definitely be a Tampa Bay wide receiver. We'll see where Chris Godwin goes if he stays, but he's 24 years old, man, 24 years old in his prime. We have not seen the best from Chris Godwin. I'm a, I'm a buyer of Chris Godwin. I think both of these guys, are the are guys you can acquire for that like mid like mid to mid to late like first round pick range? I think that's just an absolute steal. Uh, and these are the guys that if I'm on the clock uh, in the in those uh, rookie drafts, I'm definitely going to be looking to the Chris Godwin owners, the Mike Evans owners, and the Keenan Allen owners, and trying to get some veteran guys on my team. Mike, do you have the DLF ADP up right now? Yep. Where's Kenny Galladay going? Galladay is also super low. He's going like wide receiver twenty three. Okay, I was about to say, like, the difference between Mike Evans and Kenny Galladay, they're, like, four months apart in age. I just feel like Mike Evans is a more consistent and higher-end producer than Kenny Galladay with also the safety of going back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, whereas a Galladay is going to be a free agent this year. If he lands in a good spot, I could realistically see him jumping or being on par with Evans in terms of ADP. But I don't think that those two guys, like, obviously, my point wasn't made by saying Kenny Galladay is, like, valued higher than Evans right now. But I think Evans is in a different tier of player than a guy like Kenny Galladay. And going back to the Godwin point, I think it's similar to Aaron Jones where, you know, if he goes into free agency, wherever he lands is – he's has, like, a 99% chance of being the number one in that offense. There aren't many places where Godwin would go where he is playing second fiddle to anybody. And even if he is, he's been playing second fiddle to Mike Evans and he was like a top five wide receiver last year. So to me, he's a landing spot proof. He is legit. He can play on the outside. He can play on the inside yards after the catch, deep receptions, red zone monster. Like he's everything you want out of a wide receiver. And the last guy I have on my list, somebody who has been completely forgotten about. And Mike, I know you love him as well. And I'd love to know where the DLF ADP has him at. Wide is receiver. my boy, Cortland Sutton. Where's he at? Wide receiver 26. That is a little bit disrespectful. My, I have him wide receiver 21. Mm -hmm. You know, the common narrative, I think, that will be around Sutton, even if there's one at all, like nobody wants to talk about Denver, is the fact that he broke out as a sophomore, but did that with no competition, which doesn't make sense because as a rookie in the NFL, he basically played Demarius Thomas out of Denver, where Demarius Thomas was coming off a good season. As a second-year player, he played Emmanuel Sanders out of Denver, who was also coming off a pretty good year. Noah Fant was still there. And I know as a rookie, he was catching passes, like how a seal claps, like he was awful at catching passes. There was still some talent there. And the fact that he was playing with Case Keenum, then his second year, it was a motley crew of Brandon Allen, uh, Drew Locke. I think Joe Flacco was even throwing passes for whatever reason. The fact that he produced, put up 1,100 yards as a second year player in that type of offense just shows me how talented he is. And I'm not going to fall off the boat on like Jerry Judy, right? I don't think that he is a garbage receiver despite the season that he had as a rookie. He still put up like 850 yards, which is a lot more than many receivers can say that they did in a rookie season, let alone playing with like Kendall Higdon or whatever his name was that one game and Drew Locke and having a motley crew again of wider of quarterbacks under center. But I think what we've seen out of both those guys respectively is that Cortland Sutton is the number one in this offense. It could be a 1A, 1B situation. But the type of role that he fulfills, playing on the outside, being that true X, which Jerry Judy isn't really that. He's more of that 
complimentary wide receiver, kind of like a Demarius Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders type of trade off there as well, like a revamping of that where where Sutton is the Demarius Thomas to Judy's Emmanuel Sanders. I just think him being a better deep threat, him being a better red zone weapon, him still being really good after the catch. Like we look at his second year in the league, he was 17th in yak in the NFL. He was 11th in deep targets and he was ninth in red zone receptions. He's getting all of the valuable volume that you want to look for in a wide receiver. And I think with the division that they play in being the AFC West, with the Chargers having high volume offense and a very potent offense, and hopefully will continue to be such for my own sake and for their own sake, uh, the Chiefs as well being tied with Patrick Mahomes and the Oakland Raiders looking like a very good team through the first like eight weeks of the season. The Denver Broncos aren't going to be able to rely on the run. They didn't do that this year. And I think that's just going to be a trend that continues. There is that concern that the quarterback play doesn't get better. But as I like to lean back on that point, he was still putting up 1,100 yards with terrible quarterbacks. So if Drew Luck is the guy in town this year, I'm not I'm not saying he's going to be a locked-in top 24, top 20 wide receiver, but that just gives you more value to buy him at a cheaper price as the offseason goes along because nobody's going to want a receiver tied to Drew Luck. And there's always that upside that they bring in a veteran. Like a Ryan Fitzpatrick's a free agent. I would love if Ryan Fitzpatrick is brought mm-hmm. there one year, 8 million, 10 million, and he gets to feed him like he did Devontae Parker. I would mm-hmm. absolutely adore that. Or even if they get like a Mac Jones or they trade up in the draft for a Zach Wilson or Trey Lance and he gets to build that chemistry and that rapport with any of those young quarterbacks. It's just like, he's the perfect X receiver. He has shown how good he is and his situation only stands to improve. And we saw a guy like Tim Patrick, who is nowhere near the receiver Cortland Sutton is be on pace for like 70 catches, 900 yards and eight touchdowns. And that's, him you know not being the receiver Sutton is and playing a game with like Kendall I don't remember his name Kendall Hurton Hinton Hurt I, I don't know he's a wide receiver that played quarterback because everybody's on COVID it, it this situation can only get better he's a great player that's why I'm buying him he's my wide receiver 21 and he's being valued wide receiver 26. Mm-hmm. Yeah I I love love Colton Sutton I agree with you he's he's one he's been cast the wayside forgotten about because he tore his ACL I mean the best quarterback that Sutton has ever played with in the NFL is Joe Flacco. So let that sink in for a moment. All right. With Joe Flacco and Drew Locke, he put up 1,100 yards as a true, as a sophomore, uh, second year player in the NFL and playing the X alpha role. Like that's what he, that's, that, that's what they made him do. They said, Hey, you're our guy. You're that number one guy. Here you go. Um, if anything, his career, his, the start of his career blows the start of Damaris Thomas's career away because Damaris Thomas, you guys don't remember, he was a total flop year one and two. Like, he did not know how to deal with the NFL. And Cortland Sutton, like, if we added the amount of uh, PI yardage onto Cortland Sutton yardage, he would be, like, a top five wide receiver. This guy is drawing PIs, like, like 50-yard, 40-yard PIs, like, every other game. That's what I remember from watching Cortland Sutton. Like, oh, there's another PI. Yeah, there's you another... remember that? I remember him just mossing Casey Hayward every game. Yeah, so and he, yeah the... exactly. And, and he would, like, he's he is already an alpha receiver. And, like, I cannot stress this enough, all right? To make the jump from secondary wide receiver to alpha primary wide receiver, drawing the defense's top coverage, the top cornerback is a huge leap. And not many people can make that leap. So, like, I still have those concerns for someone like ACD Lamb. I still have those concerns for someone like a Chris Godwin, slightly, slightly. I, I think he's good enough that I'm not that concerned, but slightly, right? N- neither of them have like really taken on that alpha role yet. Corlin Sun did it in his second year of playing for a shit team with shit quarterbacks. So it is incredibly impressive. I made a trade. I gave up like Raheem Moser really, really early on this season uh, for Corlin Sutton. And I, you know, I joked about it. Cause like Moser went, went off like the next game for like two touchdowns, like hundred yards and Corlin Sutton got injured and blew out his knee. So, uh, but I think, you know, long-term wise, he's 24 years old. Right. So, you know, you got, there's, there, you got a plenty of time for him to continue to develop plenty of time for value to continue to rise and plenty of time for him to continue to establish himself in the NFL. And it really cannot get much worse than Joe Flacco and Drew Locke. It really can't. It really can't. Like the, the quality of targets from Drew Locke is abysmal. Um, and, you know, part of that is on the offensive line. Part of that, it's like new offense. So it's not all on Drew Locke, but, you know, we'll see what happens next year. We'll see like who they bring in at quarterback. Uh, I, I don't believe that Drew Locke is the answer. Uh, so maybe they make a move up and trade for someone. Maybe they bring in a vet, like you said, but regardless, like Cortland Sutton, Sutton, uh, Cortland Sutton is the talent on this team, and he is the alpha. I think, honestly, 
both him and Jared Judy will benefit from them being in the lineup because Jared Judy is not going to be that top guy. And having Judy is going to help Cortland Sutton draw some of the double coverage. And, and so the defense doesn't just focus entirely on him. So I'm a big fan of Cortland Sutton. I think, and I, I truly believe this, I think you can get Cortland Sutton for an early second. Oh, for sure. I, I was going to say like late first, easy. Like when Jalen Waddle is there and you see the electricity that he has and like the mm-hmm. unknown upside as compared to a guy, oh, he's in Denver. We don't know what the quarterback situation is. Jerry Judy's better than him. No offense better than him. You can easily flip that right now. Yeah. And give I think me, give me Cole and Sutton all day. And I love Jalen Waddle. Give, yeah, give me Cole and Sutton all day. And as you said, he's like still super young. And when you compare his start to his career compared to a guy like Kenny Galladay, I'm looking right now, Kenny Galladay as a rookie, although he was sharing a field with Golden Tate and Marvin Jones, who were already established, he only had 20 receptions, 477 yards, three touchdowns. Cortland Sutton, his rookie year, did have over 700 yards. But then his second year, right, Kenny Galladay goes from 470 yards to 1,063 yards and five touchdowns. Cortland Sutton, his second year, goes from 700 yards to 1,100 yards, four touchdowns to six touchdowns. It's a very similar career arc, and Cortland Sutton is now in that prime where, you know, Kenny Galladay went for almost 1200 yards and 11 touchdowns. And he has the same type of deep ball ability, the same jump ball ability, the same red zone ability. I think he might have a similar rise to fame as a, as a Kenny Galladay has. And if we remember back to last year before Kenny Galladay missed like the entire season, he's being drafted as like a top 12 to 15 wide receiver, Cortland Sutton going as wide receiver 26 off the board. Like I'm not so sure I would even take Kenny Galladay ahead of him right now, because even though Sutton's situation looks a little bit up in the air, Kenny Galladay still is that free agent and he might land in a New York Giants type of situation, which could be really shitty. Plus, he has like three years on him. So I think Cortland Sutton just looking, obviously, the ADP just solidifies my thoughts. And I've, I've made trades. I know early in the season, I traded Jerry Judy in a second for, I think, Sutton in a third. And then he blew out his ACL, which kind of hurt me. But yeah. if you can pull off a move like that, I would just buy in on Sutton because I, I realistically think he could be a... I don't think it's unrealistic to see him as a top 12 dynasty receiver after this year being 25 and putting up, let's say like 1200, 1300 yards, eight touchdowns. And if they do get like a Jameis Winston and he's legit or a young quarterback and he's legit or a bridge quarterback, and they feel like they can add somebody in 2022 free agency, then the sky's really the limit for him. Yeah. I don't like, I don't think the gap between a Corlin Sutton and a let's call it, you know, even a T Higgins who I love is, is really that warranted. Although I think T Higgins is also undervalued at wide receiver 14, but mm-hmm. Colton Sutton, like the guys going ahead of him, like DJ Chark, I would hundred percent rather have Colton Sutton chase Claypool. I'd probably rather have Colton Sutton. Although, you know, I do like chase Claypool now, Kenny Galley, like you said, I think I'd rather it's, it's definitely close, uh, but I think I'd rather have Colton Sutton. Jared Judy's going like a full half round ahead of him. I have a hundred percent, 10 times out of 10, give me Colton Sutton over Jared Judy. That's, that's for sure. Um, and you know, Juju Keenan Allen, like, I think, I think he's a lot closer to some of these guys than people think. And, you know, like David Montgomery going a full round and a half ahead of Cortland Sutton, Joe Mixon going a full round and a half after, uh, ahead of Cortland Sutton. Like that means you could probably get Cortland Sutton plus a second Cortland Sutton plus maybe, maybe a late first, but at least Cortland Sutton plus a second for David Montgomery all day, every day. Like if you can make that trade based on this ADP now, we don't know how, how clean this ADP is, but if you can make that trade, you should be absolutely doing it. I think Colton Sutton, you know, similar to Higgins is someone that I'm going to be targeting by using a trade down strategy. I'm going to take like a higher end wide receiver and trade down for Colton Sutton plus I'm going to take like a, you know, an Amari Cooper trade down for Colton Sutton plus I'm going to take a, uh, let's see who are some of these like DeAndre Hopkins, man. Take DeAndre I Hopkins. Say, you could probably easily do DeAndre Hopkins and a late for or for Cortland Sutton and a late first. Yeah. And when you put names to that and you can get like a Rondell Moore plus a Cortland Sutton yeah. and you like shave off five, six years off a player's career. That's a smash except type of deal. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, you could you could even go super high end if you wanted, right? And take take like uh you know a DK Metcalf, right? DK Metcalf, you could probably get DK Metcalf for Cortland Sutton plus like an early first, like a top three pick plus more. I, I would, I would bet you that you could get that deal done. And I love DK Metcalf, but I think Colton Sutton is just screaming value. And out of everyone that we've named, I think he's the best value out of everyone. And he's the most attainable because people have forgotten about him. So 
you know, don't forget about Cortland Sutton. He was a good, I loved him as a prospect too. Like I was super high on Cortland Sutton coming in. Yeah. And an underrated thing about him too, is like, he had a crazy agility score. Like people saw him as a jump ball receiver, but then his like, I think it was like 90th percentile. I'll check right now, but like he played, I think safety coming out of high school and then like in college as well. And they didn't know if he'd translate. Like he's one of the best jump ball and deep ball receivers in the NFL, despite being as young as he is having the agility that he has and the size and frame that he has. Like he's not even in his prime yet, and he already put up an 1100 yard season, which just speaks to how good of a player he is, how good of a prospect he was. A lot of people were mocking him as like a top 20 pick in the NFL draft and going to Dallas that year because he was from SMU and they thought there was ties there. It didn't happen. He went early in the second, but yeah, I'm looking. Agility is 97th percentile. percentile, catch radius, 90th percentile, 84th percentile, height, size adjusted speed. Guy's 6'3, 218, best comparable players, Alshon Jeffrey. He's Alshon Jeffrey without the riddled injury history. I know after this year, it's tough to say that. But, I mean, we've seen so many young players come back from ACL tears and be legit, whether it's Will Fuller, whether it's Cooper Cup, even like a Julian Edelman late in his career, that those type of injuries, like how early it happened to him in the season, it doesn't really bring me any concern going into next year. Yeah, I think like the beauty of Corlin Sutton is this, like it, it literally cannot get worse than Joe Flacco and Drew Locke. It can't. It can't. And like, even if it gets worse this year, like over the next two to three years, like there's got to be like a solution there somewhere. So you ca- you're kind of like getting a basement level, like floor price for him right now, right? Like that 1100 yards in his second year. If he gets a full season over the next couple of years, I have no doubts that he can actually like reach like 13, 400, 1400 yards and double digit touchdowns, which is going to give you a top five wide receiver production. So if, if that happens, then he's going to fall into that unattainable tier. And right now you can attain him just because you got injured last year. So definitely, definitely, definitely smash the buy button on court and Sutton. So uh, that's all we got for you guys. From the players, we, we wanted to focus on wide receivers um, just because we don't want you guys to forget about some of the talent that's in the league that can really help you win your leagues. So just to recap real quick, we had it, uh, you know, you had Aaron Jones was the only running back we talked about, but we had Keenan Allen, Michael Thomas, uh, Cortland Sutton, Mike Evans, and Chris Godwin. So all those veteran guys, all guys who I think are very attainable, all guys who aren't going to cost you multiple first round picks. I think that's key. It's like, I don't think you're going to have to lose too much depth to get these guys. You're just going to be able to get production. And you know, once, once the draft comes around and once the hype starts, man, I'm telling you, like there's going to be people that just like auto click Devonta Smith over Cortland Sutton, kidding down all these guys. And there's no chance I'm doing that. So Make sure you guys stay on top of that type of value. Target these guys in your leagues. Uh, target them between now and the draft. And, you know, you give up rookie picks if you have to, if you're a contender. But these are just these are just great, great people to go with. And it's not like they're rentals, man. They're going to last a long time for you. And a long time to me is like two, three years. Because like, we don't know what the fuck's going to happen like four or five years from now. So planning for that is kind of stupid, in my opinion. So just get what you can now and uh, contribute in the next couple of years to your contending rosters. Yeah, and you look like the top receivers this year. I know we're, like, wrapping up the video, but you look at the top receivers, whether it's, like, Devonta Adams, DeAndre Hopkins, Michael Thomas, if he was healthy on a point-per-game basis, he was elite. Like, these guys are 28, 29 years old. Like, Keenan Allen as well, like, 29 years old. He probably still has two, three years in the, left in the tank. A Cortland Sutton has, like, four years in his prime. Like, they're not old. Like, you might think 30 is old, but for a receiver with the skill sets that they have, even, like, an Adam Thielen, we've seen what they can do at that age. I mean, we, we joke a lot that 28 is the new 35, which is the new retiree. But honestly, like play off of those jokes, play off of that hyperbole and capitalize on these players that people think are going to retire right around the corner. Like not to shit on Scott, but I remember I tried to offer him Mike Evans one league. He's like, eh, he's 27, going to be 28 next year. I'm not in on that. He missed out on a season where he had 13 touchdowns where he's banged up all year. And next year when Tom Brady's back and they're coming off of a Super Bowl hangover or the Super Bowl win, whatever it is, I mean, he's still going to be a top five, top 10 receiver locked in. So uh, don't don't be too afraid of these age numbers next to a player's name, especially if you're contending, because that's how you get a lot of the value. And, you know, I, I'm a big proponent, or I was like two years ago, just drafting Julian Edelman in like the 14th round because nobody wanted a guy that age. And two years ago, he had a really good season. He fell off this year. But even if it's like a one-year rental for a guy that's 33, 34 years old, or Marvin Jones, like you caped up for this season, who had a great second half to the year. I mean, you're going to get so much more value in return than taking a shot on like a third round wide receiver than like a, uh, a KJ Hamler or a Van Jefferson. I'd much rather just have the one or two years of Marvin Jones at that price. Yep. All right. That's all we got for you guys. Hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure you subscribe, hit the thumbs up, follow Noah, follow me, uh, stick around for the channel. we got lots of content coming 
Um, and you know, if, if you're in any of the top shots, man, check out, check out our new show. Let us know what you like about it. Let us know what you hate about it. Let us know if we made you money. Let us know if we lost you money. Actually, no, we can't lose you money. Cause you can only, you can lose yourself money by, by either acting or listening to our advice, but hopefully we made you money. So stay tuned for that. We're going to have a lot more content coming that way. Uh, no, and I are both playing in the market pretty heavily. So we'll have a lot of insights for you guys there. Um, and then, yeah, man, just stick around and then we're going to have a lot of content, man. It's dynasty off season, which means there really is no off season. It's my favorite time of the year. We get to do whatever we want from content. And, you know, we had a meeting between Noah and myself and we have a lot of good shit coming your way. So stay tuned. Yeah. It's nice to know what we have on the docket. So I'm ready. You're ready. It's time to eat, but it's the end of the video. So we're about to say peace out and we'll see you guys next week. Peace. Thank you.